Presently, we're, there is a lot of turmoil happening in the world. We have floods in Australia on the east coast. There's a conflict in the Ukraine that everyone's heard about, and we're still getting over the effects of the pandemic. So it's all seems to be doom and gloom. But we're, we're going to look at a different perspective today. And we have back on the show Tracy Phillips, who is a business executive and leadership coach. And she's been on a previous episode called Are We in a Mental Health Crisis? Uh, and that was episode number 89. So, uh, yeah, refer back to that because this is a bit of a follow-on episode to that because uh, Tracy touched on this point of, are we essentially breaking down to break through? And that is the title of today's episode. It is unpacking the process of breaking down to break through. So welcome to another episode of Me and My Health Up. I'm your host, Anthony Harcher. I'm a clinical nutritionist and lifestyle medicine specialist. The purpose of this podcast is to enhance and enlighten your well-being. And Tracy's going to be doing just that today. How are you, Tracy? I'm doing well, Anthony. Thank you so much for having me back on. So uh, the listeners are demanding you to come back on. You, you, you obviously deliver a lot of value uh, to the podcast show. So uh, thank you for returning and uh, putting aside the time to, uh, I guess, provide some great insight into, I guess, the way we perceive the world and how we could um, look at it better. So uh, let's start with... Uh, you know, we're, we're in a lot of turmoil at the moment uh, and we're perceiving that turmoil and it's causing a lot of anxiety and, uh, you know, people are really affected uh, by all the, you know, everything that's going on around them. So uh, how, how, how do you help your clients to work through this sort of, um, you know, I guess, conf you know, there's, I guess there's a bit of internal conflict going as a result of external conflicts? Absolutely. Well, you know, one of, and it's true, I mean, as we were talking about off air, you know, we're really, if we look at history, we've never been in a time, you know, known to man where there hasn't been conflict. And, you know, whether we personally, you know, have had lots of conflict in our own lives or, you know, whether it's been pretty smooth sailing, you know, great, gratefully. Um, and so this is kind of a new endeavor for us, you know, it, it, the people on the planet have been dealing with conflict forever. And so it's really not conflict itself that, that I have, you know, my clients look at is, but our re relationship with it, right? So, you know, we, we all have heard many times that people don't like change, right? It's people have, I think we have an equal desire for change and aversion to change at the same time, which makes it for a very interesting conversation or for a very interesting um, relationship. Because if we think about that as a person, you know, it'd be that constant push pull that we have with an individual. Um, many of us, we do crave change and just in the nature of, of us as human beings, because we need growth, right? And in part, part of what is in the fabric of growth is, is change. Um, and on the other side, you know, we've equated change to, you know, uncomfortable situations, especially if we've actually endeavored, you know, those types of experiences in our lives when change has happened. You know, we have physical proof that we then can go back and say, yeah, that was hard. I didn't like that. Um, you know, and, and even the evolution of our own personal development, you know, comes with having, you know, we look in and we have to look at all of our stuff and kind of recognize where we have the challenges within us, you know, that are either holding us back or, you know, keeping us in some form of, of discomfort. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I always have clients start off with, I, I have this model that I show them. And I don't even know if we talked about this in the last episode, we might have, but, you know, it's kind of one of my main models and it's to show kind of where our, our true locus of control is. And, and the way it works is we, we look at the fact that there's a circumstance that happens, right? So things happen in the world, what's been going on in the Ukraine, or as you reference the floods that are going on currently in Australia, right? So there could be a circumstance with that, either the circumstances it's happening to us uh, or that we're watching it on TV or that we're hearing about it, right? That can be, that can constitute a circumstance. From that circumstance, and then that circumstance is outside of our control, you know, in many, in many cases. But what we do with that circumstance, right, then becomes within the measure of our control. And so the very first thing that happens when, let's say, we hear about flooding, Right. And we, we hear about, you know, the terrible things that are happening to people, you know, who are in these floods. We have a thought about that. Right. So the circumstance happens. 
we have a thought about that. The thought then kind of starts to merge together with other thoughts and, and creates a narrative, right? Again, something we've created from the original circumstance right, that we either hear about or experience, right? So those thoughts become a narrative or, or story. Those stories then will trigger emotions, right? Then we have feelings about it. And this can all happen within like fractions of a second. <laughs> um, so it's not as if, you know, we, we can always bear witness to this unless we're really truly aware of, of, of you know, and, and intentional about it. Um, so basically then now we have these feelings about the original circumstance based on the narrative that we've been telling ourselves about it, or we started telling ourselves about it. Those feelings then trigger us to take certain actions, right? Um, and then those actions become outcomes, right? So if we look at that entire model, you know, it really is showing that although the circumstance might be out of your control, everything after that is within your control. And people will say, well, what, what do you mean? I mean, that loop happens so quickly between thought and feeling, for example, we don't even notice the narrative. <laughs> we don't even notice that a thought became an actual story because we go straight to the feeling and then we're reacting oftentimes, especially if it's a crisis type of situation, you know, in a, in a very reactionary and, and deeply, you know, um, emotionally disturbing way, right? And so within us, we have fear or we have concern or, you know, we, we immediately feel in some cases we need to take action, you know, to, to help um, or to do something or to run or, you know, whatever it happens to be. And so in, in, in many cases, I mean, if this is an actual, uh, like, for example, I, I say there's a difference between um, legitimate fears, what I call legitimate fears, and the fears that we make up through our narratives, you know, a legitimate fear is I'm careening off a cliff and I'm about to die. That's a legitimate time to be fearful. But most of the time, that's not our circumstance, right? It can be that we hear something on the news and then immediately we go into this narrative that creates emotion and then we're acting, right? And action doesn't always mean physical action. It can mean the triggered actions within our bodies, right? When we start to go into fear, right? That floods, you know, our, our system, our adrenals and all of these things happen, these actions happen internally that create, you know, certain things with our health, right? And then based on that, you know, we, you know, other actions then come from that, um, outcomes come from that, that can lead to other actions. And then the loop continues. Um, so this is really something that I point out because one, to show people how much in the driver's seat we actually are. And two, that we're making up a story all the time about our lives. Our, our version of reality becomes, you know, our perception of what reality actually is. And so, you know, when we make up a particular story, whether that story is, you know, exactly what happened or not, I don't think there is such a thing as the exact reality as we see it, because everybody in a circumstance has different viewpoints of that circumstance. So really to remember that our reality is what we make you know, our circumstances up to be. And so based on that, we have control over the stories we make up. We don't think we do. We think, oh, if something bad happens, we have to think badly. And that's actually not the case. And so that's kind of where I start is that we, we have an ability to frame things. And by, by taking control of that ability to frame things, we actually can change the reality and, you know, in which we, we operate and, and what we experience. And with your clients, like obviously you make them aware of, you know, this is a narrative they're telling themselves and you ask them to then write down that narrative and then look at the evidence that supports it or look at the lack of evidence that there is for that. Does that, is that part of the process of helping them step through uh, or make them realize that, it, you know, it, it, it is a story and it's quite exaggerated story and, you know, it, it's not necessarily going to happen. And mm -hmm. the other question I had was, is this a protective mechanism that we have within us? Like, so when we, you know, hear of something, we tend to exacerbate it and make it bigger and worse and more fearful. And is that, that, that primal instinct to actually take some action that's more like a conservative approach as opposed to this, you know, always having this optimism that it's not going to happen and everything's going to be okay. Is, is there, is there any truth to what I'm sort of, I guess, leading to here? Well, you know, that, that's, that's excellent. Both actually, both are really good questions. Um, and I'll start with the second part two <laughs> to the, the original 
question, um, you know, is that everybody is, you know, we have different personalities and within our personalities, you know, there's that natural inclination based on our unique you know, personality traits, right? So some people are just better, like that you hear about the people who are just really good under pressure. Um, their reaction to crisis situations is different. Um, and so there's that piece, right, that we, we look at. So not everybody reacts, you know, to a, let's say, a, a really critical story or, or a tragic story in the same way. Um, and so you have that piece. But then on top of it, we have to really remember that, you know, since, since man realized that we can tell stories to elicit particular actions from people. So if you get people feeling a certain way, because we don't really make decisions as much by what we think as we do how we feel, right? We think, oh, I have to think that over. What really we're making, you know, when we make a final decision, it's based on how we feel, right? We feel better about this choice than that choice, let's say. Um, and so when we realized, and this is a sales tactic, right? You know, marketing and sales and all that, it's like, you know, when you can elicit a particular emotion in someone, you can get them to do whatever you want them to do. And so that then became a more of a manipulative device. I mean, not always in a negative way. I mean, I guess you could say, you know, if somebody's trying to get to your emotions to buy a product, you know, that's not necessarily a great thing, but you know, that that's really the basis of it. And so, you know, we have been led down this road to look at the negative. Now we're already primed for it, right? We, we already, our brain is already wired for the negative to begin with. And that's, you know, to, to survive as a species you know, being able to think about worst case scenario or, you know, at least figure out, you know, where the exit, you know, strategy happens to be, you know, is a part of what has kept us alive. But when you augment that by, by also looking at the manipulation that's gone on to try to get people to feel a certain way so they'll make certain choices and, and take certain actions, then you can see that we've been living in kind of a, melt, you know, this pot of, of thinking and, 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 you know, focusing on the pain points or the negative, you know, cause they, you hear that in sales, like find their pain point and then make them aware of it <laughs> and you'll get them to buy your product or whatever it is. And so we, we've been conditioned to that piece, right? That's an additional to how our brain was wired. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot that if we're on autopilot, we're definitely going to go down that track because we've been trained to both biologically speaking and also in, in our conditioning, right? Our, our social conditioning. So that's, you know, to kind of recognize what the playing field is, right? That's what we're dealing with. Um, and like I said, if we're on autopilot and we're not being intentional about this, we will go towards, you know, the, oh, how awfuls is what I call them. You know, it's like, we'll hear a bad story and it's like, oh, we'll just totally fixate on all of the awful things that either are happening or could happen from that scenario. Instead of saying, again, okay, realizing that that's actually a story, all of it is a story. I mean, even setting ourselves up for a worst case scenario to prepare ourselves, it's still a story. It's not actually happening in the moment. Now, the more we think about it, we bring it about, right? So the whole law of attraction piece where if we keep focusing on it, we magnetize it. Now it's actually happening. And that's what usually happens why people say, but, but it did happen, but it did happen. You know, I mean, it's a good thing I was prepared because it did happen. I'm like, how do you know that it did happen? How do you not know that it did happen because you were thinking about it happening so, you know, extremely that you brought it to, to your doorstep, right? And so a lot of this is to say, if we're making up these things, I'm not saying don't be strategic. I mean, one of the things I help clients to do is be strategic, you know, based on what their zone of brilliance is and really where they need to operate from that place. How can you then strategize and make decisions based on what you do best and bringing the most value to the table, right? So it's not about not strategizing and looking at all of the, 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 the various avenues, but we don't usually use it just to strategize. You know, it's not like, okay, let me figure that out for a second. And then I'm going to have that waiting in the wings in case I need to use it. No, we usually fixate on it. Right. It goes beyond just using it as strategy. And that's where we have to start to become aware of where our narratives are maybe, you know, not taking us in the direction or pulling and magnetizing to us the things that we want. So there's a narrative that I'm hearing at the moment, you know, in terms of what's going on in the Ukraine is, you know, Russia's got all these nuclear warheads and, you know, they're getting ready for a nuclear arms race and, and they're starting, you know, to build that up and we're going to have World War Three, you know, all these nuclear bombs going off everywhere and it's going to be, I guess, doomsday for all of us. Uh, mm -hmm. how, it, when you hear that from a client, what's the, the, the process beyond saying, well, okay, that's your perception 
of what's going on mm -hmm. and how do you then help them break it down to then say well you know the, the likelihood of that happening or uh you know is it um you know yeah so just wanting to better understand those sort of next steps beyond that awareness piece that they, that's your narrative um what is the next what, what's the process beyond that so I'm a child of the 80s, and if anything, anybody knows anything about the 80s, I mean, we were in a, a Cold War with Russia. <laughs> and it went on for pretty much my whole growing up years, right? So there were always things in the news about how they were going to bomb us, you know, how we might have to bomb them, how in World War III. So this is not a new narrative, right? This has been going on for a very long time. It's just being dredged up again for whatever reason it is, you know, whatever's going on. The, the one thing I like to remind clients or anybody for that matter, you know, listeners today, you know, is that I, I ask clients and like, okay, so this is the concern that you have. And I can use actually a, a, a more probably not everybody is all hyped up about the Ukraine. It can be more close to home. I had a client um, just the other day who, you know, got in touch with me and says, I just, I'm in my cycle again. I cannot focus on my work. This thing happened with my wife who's being mistreated at work. And we think, you know, they're trying to push her out. You know, she's been, you know, kind of an exe she's been an executive in this particular position for a while and she's aging out. And we think that there might be something going on that they want her to retire early or whatever. And he said all he could think about was just how unfair the situation was and how she was being treated. And I said, well, is there anything that you can control in this situation? And he, he said, well, I mean, we can, we can, you know, keep track of everything and, and, and take them to court if it's an age, you know, related type of thing. And, you know, we can, I said, right here in this moment, is there anything you can control about that scenario? And he said, my reaction to it, <laughs> right, right, right now in this moment, the only thing you can control is your reaction to that idea, thought, circumstance, whatever it happens to be. So we forget that because we're always in the past and we're always in the future, right? Very seldomly are we truly in the present moment, but yet everything in our lives happens in a present moment. All the present moments string together and become our life, but everything we're living is in a present moment. And what we tend to forget is that present moment, right? So in the present moment, I always ask people in the present moment, what is within your control, right? If it's a legitimate fear and you've got I don't know, some ax murderer coming at you. Yeah, in that moment, there is action you can take, right? You can go straight from that fear response, you know, to, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm under attack to taking action and creating hopefully the outcome you want. But most, like I said, most of the time we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with something not even in the future. It's a potential. Guess what? Everything, any story, any one of us could make up at any moment in this present space could be a potential, right? Anything we could think of could be a potential. Now, is it happening right now? You know, might it happen? I don't know, right? Anything that we don't know is out of our power of control. And so we have to deal with what we do know. And right now, what we do know is we're starting to get freaked out about something that is a potential, not a reality. And so it's, it's really more about reining ourselves in and gaining a perspective where we can step back. Because isn't that what perspective is? Perspective is being able to step back so we can see things more clearly, right? So anytime we're in fight or flight type of situation and it isn't a legitimately, you know, it's not something that's legitimately happening in the present moment, then it's really important to step back and get perspective. And that's really what the breakdown to breakthrough piece that, you know, came up in our last conversation you know, arose from is this idea of saying, you know, is it, what if, you know, what, what if we got this all wrong? What if, what if Russia's not the bad guys? <laughs> what if somebody else is, right? I mean, like we could play that what if game and I, I don't mean to be making fun of this, so I don't want to upset anybody, but we don't know for certain. We only know what we're being told and we only know what we're making up in our mind, but we don't know what the truth is. Right. And we can find the truth, but it's not going to be from here and it's not going to be from the outside world. It's going to be from going in and using our gut instincts. And people say, well, my gut is telling me I'm under I'm under attack. I go, then it's not your gut talking to you. Because that's not how the gut speaks to us. Right. And so part of it is learning, you know, these different things. Am I being hijacked in reality or am I being hijacked by my illusionary fears? 
right? Based on the, on, on the narratives that I'm telling myself. And so it's, it really is about recognizing that perhaps if we're under a certain amount of pressure right now, it is to tell us that we have all of these defense mechanisms. It's, it's kind of like if we did live in a utopia and yet people felt they needed to have a 10 foot wall built around them at all times. When there's no legitimate, if we're in a utopia, there's no legitimate risk, right? Utopia means that nobody's killing anybody, nothing terrible is happening. But that's how I like people to think about it is that where are you building walls when they aren't even necessary? Because that's the thing that's not only blocking, I mean, you may feel it's blocking anything bad from getting in, but it's blocking you from your life. And you don't know that's it true. because you're constantly yeah. in fight or flight. I mean, you walk in the door of any unknown situation and you've got your dukes up. And what happens, I mean, you, you know this, right, is that when we're in fight or flight, the frontal part of our brain, our thinking brain shuts down. So we can't think effectively. We can't even make good decisions. When we're back here, we're operating just from, you know, that reptilian brain of reaction. And so that's where things have kind of gotten a little crazy in this world is because, you know, most people, have, not most people, I'll, I'll reframe that. A lot of people for a long time that we've been through, what we've been going through, have been activating from back here. So when people are like, what were they thinking? They weren't. <laughs> Literally, this part of their brain was shut down. They were not thinking. They could not access rational thought, right? When you go in temporary, temporarily insane, that's, that's what happens. And it actually happens quite a lot when people are, are hijacked by, you know, these, these illegitimate fears, right? Over hey. and over and over and over again. So we're getting to the point, I think, where so much is happening to kind of break through our walls that we're putting up, our, our defense mechanisms, because they are there to, to liter literally and legitimately protect us, but we don't need them to be constantly, you know, coming out and fighting against the world because that's really blocking us from having, you know, having the life we really want to begin with. You know, if... if the, a Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, you know, wrote the book, A Man's Search for Meaning, and it was in his experience in concentration camp and his witnessing, bearing witness of all of the horrors and joys that happened when he was there. I mean, if we can find joy in the most horrific experience, that, that, that proves that joy is always a choice. Okay? And so that's what I, I, I want people to remember is that, you know, it's your choice. It's not, you know, life is not happening to you. It's happening for you to make choices that are either aligned or misaligned, depending on the experiences you want to have. And they, uh, that I've heard that um, reframing that perception around seeing life as a struggle. And if you, if you just, you know, if, if life is a constant struggle, then the purpose of life is to find the joy amongst the struggle. Whereas I think we see life's supposed to be blissful and joyful, and therefore we can't you know, put up with any struggle. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas, yeah, you could look at it in the other context is thinking, well, yeah, life's a constant struggle. And my purpose here is to find joy amongst the struggle. And, uh, and that, that's exactly where uh, Victor Frankl, uh, um, you know, talks about in terms of yeah. uh, him, you know, going, experiencing everything else, what the other uh, prisoners of war were experiencing. Um, but he, he took it in a different way. And, yeah, uh, yeah so I, um, I was just wanting to go back because you mentioned fight or flight a lot and us, you know, that I guess that frontal lobe where, where we make our rational decisions is, you know, uh, I guess not operating as effectively as it, as it does when it's relaxed and we're more, you know, reacting from the amygdala, which is that reptilian brain and that sort of knee-jerk response. And I'm thinking, like, if you look at that pandemic that we've just been through and that's, you know, in invoked a lot of stress in us. Mm -hmm. And so our ability to look at other situations rationally is somewhat impaired. And I, th and th this is what you, you're sharing with us is in a sense that we, we, we have been going through this process of breaking down but what you're sharing with us is a process to go from that breakdown to break through and see it as an opportunity to grow from it and be, be better prepared in the future to respond to adverse events in your life. And as you said, they could be anything. They could be very close to home, such as 
your wife that's you know you you know you're worried about her losing her job so um mm. yeah so have you got any comments around i guess the recommendations that you share with your clients to be in a better state of mind to uh, see things better as like you said the observer of your thoughts mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking you're amongst all these or well, you are part of your thoughts um so mm -hmm. yeah have you got any sort of strategies in terms of helping people stay as that observer of their thoughts and understanding okay that's a narrative let that slip through um <laughs> i've only got to focus on what i can control yeah, have you got any sort of like um, proactive strategies around helping people to stay in this frame of mind? Yeah, so one of the things that like we, I wanted to, to say, I have a, I wanted to further the the last comment that you you made about you know life is a struggle. If we can look at life as a struggle, and that really our our point is to find the joys, you know, between the struggles. I look at it actually as life is about growth, and we need two main ingredients for growth. We need support and challenge. And so our job is really as creators of our own life, right? As we make up the stories of what is happening to us, we it's, it's about recognizing where the challenges are, where the supports are, so we can use them in equal measure to grow, right? In other words, we have to look at challenge as an ingredient to growth, not as just straight on challenge or struggle, right? Because when we experience it that way, it feels hard. And not to say that it isn't, difficult to get through a big challenge, but when we're experiencing a different way, and I'll give an example, like I'll give my own personal example. We recently had one of our dogs who was very, very close to us pass away suddenly. And it was a total shock. Um, she had been out running around playing with our other dog and then just collapsed and died. And I was with her when she passed away. My husband had run into the house to call the emergency vet and she seized and died right there, right you know, with my hands on her. Um, and, you know, in that moment, you know, trying to process what was going on to, you know, with our beloved pet and not even being able to do anything to help her other than be with her. One of the stories I remembered that came up almost instantaneously was a blog I had read from a vet who said that he actually stopped putting animals down if the owner could not be present with the animal when they passed. Because what he had witnessed for far too long was, you know, these pet owners who could, just couldn't stand watching their pet pass away and actually left the pet to be alone in those final moments. And he said too often he could see the eyes of the pet, you know, searching for the one they loved most who wasn't present and that that was just a devastating experience for him. And he didn't feel that that was fair. And so just knowing that she passed not alone, you know, was something that allowed me to feel gratitude both for being there, but also for her. But what was interesting is when, you know, after it was all said and done, I just felt this need to, to reach out and talk to someone. So I called my brother who, you know, we've lived in separate states for quite some time and we were really close growing up. But I think through time and being apart, you know, we both have felt, you know, the lack of, of, of that time together. And he is a huge dog lover. And so I called him and we had one of the best conversations I've had with him in years. And at the end, I finally realized, and I said to him, I said, oh, you know, this was a gift. Our dog's name was Kina. And I said, this was a gift from Kina. She was always a reminder for me of, to stay present. If I would come into the room, she would, she was a border collie and she would poke me with her nose. She's a herding dog, right? And poke me. And I, and I had to, you know, lean down and pet her and receive her love. She was always reminding us to come together as a family. She loved to bring us together at night as a family you know, and she was always happiest when everybody was in the room together. But she was really that, that's what she was and what I recognized. And in that moment, if she had not passed, I wouldn't have picked up the phone to call my brother. And I wouldn't have had that incredibly, you know, connective conversation. And we, we talked about all sorts of things we hadn't talked about in years. And he, had, he was there for me in the perfect way. And so I recognized that, you know, in something that was so devastating and so sudden and, and shocking and sad, that there were so many gifts that I could, I could, I could see equally quickly, right? Because I was trained, I was training myself to do that, you know, is that I can't feel that she passed in vain, right? That what was her life really about? It wasn't about focusing on her not being, in, being there as what, what she had brought when she was. And so that's just, you know, a, a small story of where we can start to train ourselves. You know, we still feel the emotion. We still feel the pain. We still feel the grief. 
but part of it is giving it, you know, some form of purpose so that we can grow through that and we can recognize aspects of ourselves and we can recognize aspects of like my, my dog and what she represented to me. You know, I hadn't really thought about that, right? Until all of that happened, like, oh, this is what she really has come to represent. You know, so all of these things are just, you know, to say that we have more control than we think about the experiences that we're experiencing. It's a, f a fantastic uh, story and so, you know, so sad to hear your loss. Uh, I've had uh, similar situations as growing up as a kid and uh, watching dogs pass or, you know, beloved pets pass. So, um, yeah, it, sort of, it certainly brought back memories to me and uh, I was uh, lucky to be with my pet as well when it passed. And, uh, yeah, so uh, it was, um, I guess that memory stayed with me for a, for a lifetime. So, but uh, I really appreciate what you've shared with us today, Tracy. You've provided terrific insight into, you know, in terms of us understanding or being the observer of our narrative, what, are, what we're telling ourselves and the story we're making up and, and, and a reminder to get back into the present moment because, uh, as you said, that's, you know, it's, that's what life is, essentially. It's, a, you know, a continuous role of present moments uh, makes up our life. So the more we can, you know, get back into the present moment, think more rationally about the situation or the thought that we've got happening or the narrative that is happening within our minds, the better off we are and we can do something about it and take action. Uh, so, Tracy, how can the listeners best reach out and connect with you to get help around these areas of mindset and uh, leadership and executive coaching that you do? Well, thank you, first of all, for, for you know, again, having me on and for being able to have these conversations because I do think that they're very important. And if you know, listeners do want to reach out, the best way to, to kind of see what I'm up to and also to you know, contact me is through my website, and that is uh, theinnatecoach.com. Uh, and so the, the people can, you know, see what my offerings are. They can see what I'm up to. They can read my blog posts and, and they can reach out and contact me. And, you know, and I love hearing from people uh, what, you know, what various topics that, you know, I'm talking about has reson have resonated with them. And a lot of times I'll get people's stories as well, which I really also appreciate. Yes, yeah, so I'll put the website link in the show notes for the listeners to go directly to. And also listeners, uh, follow Tracy on LinkedIn. She's very active on LinkedIn and she shares a lot of insightful articles on LinkedIn. So uh, yes, I thoroughly recommend you look up Tracy Phillips, uh, Tracy with an I. And uh, yeah, I'll also include the link uh, to Tracy's LinkedIn page um, in the show notes so that you can uh, directly follow Tracy there and uh, go on your journey of personal development as well uh, with Tracy's insights. So uh Listeners, thank you for tuning in to another insightful episode. Really appreciate your feedback that you're giving me. It's inspiring me to keep going and keep delivering more great content around health, wellness, and happiness. So thank you again. Please like and share the episode. Leave a review. That way this reaches out to more people. So thanks again. Bye for now.